Cool. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for coming online to see this presentation. Uh, I hope everyone is keeping safe, keeping healthy. Um, I'm uh, Dr. Michael Rivera. I'm a Filipino Chinese scientist originally born in Hong Kong, and I officially graduated with my PhD last year at the University of Cambridge in my field of biological anthropology. Um, biological anthropology is probably one of the you know, less hard STEM subjects because we mix in a bunch of humanities sorts of uh, approaches and theoretical frameworks into our research. So today I'll be digging into the history of our discipline to give you a guy, uh, to give you guys a sense of the sorts of questions we've always been interested in and also tell you a little bit about my own work and where others are heading in the future. Um, if you want to use the chat uh, as I'm speaking to ask any quick questions, I have it open. I can answer any quick questions as we go along. And if you want to tweet about it, what I'm talking about, then feel free to do so. I'm happy to do that. And that's my Twitter handle there. So um, roughly, let me see if this works. Yeah, so roughly this talk will be about where my field began, where it is now and where it's going in the future. And to start with, uh, biological anthropology is basically the study of people, um, human beings, homo sapiens from a biological perspective. And right now at the core of what we do, we're interested in our biological variation. So our adaptation to different environments, our relationships with other animals, such as chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas, other apes and monkeys, because sometimes this gives us clues as to how unique we are as a species. And we always examine questions about the biology um, through a evolutionary perspective. Um, why is it that we look the way that we do? Is behavior or the ways that we organize our families and societies, the way that we digest our food, how healthy we are, uh, where do these human traits evolve from? Is it environment? Is it genes? Is it something else entirely that has led to the evolution of certain traits? So um, the study of human variation, of course, goes back centuries and centuries. Today, there is so much discourse about race. Very few people know that the human instinct to categorize people into groups actually goes back that far. Um, the ancient Egyptians had um, the Book of Gates, for example, which was this ancient uh, funerary text, and uh, it basically described all the different kinds of people that would um, go into the underworld after death. And borrowing from one part of this tome, um, specifically, ancient scholars and scribes, they would use these pictures and hieroglyphs to illustrate a division of Egyptian people into four categories known at the time, um, the Berber or Libyans, um, the, the Nubians, the Asiatics, which would be me, <laughs> and the, the Reth or um, the Egyptians. And so these were not rooted in any scientific basis um, because they didn't have genetics back then. And the ancient Egyptians believed that each of these groups were made of a distinctive category of people, um, distinguishable by their skin color, their place of origin, um, even their behavior. There's a Roman philosopher who you might know called Pliny the Elder. He had his own theories and he thought that white Europeans were civilized and uh, all other people were either like barbarians or monstrous individuals. And um, the Bible, of course, contains lots of similar categories based on skin color. Um, there's also this thing called the Great Chain of Being, which is on the right image there, um, invented by Plato and Aristotle. And they played a key role in sort of laying the foundations for taxonomy, perhaps, um, where observations of everything from animals and humans um, were put into taxonomic categories. And they described this Great Chain of Being being like a ladder where um, you know, all objects and plants and animals and humans and even like celestial beings um, can be mapped in this hierarchy. And when he wrote, when he um, wrote about humans, Aristotle expressed this belief that certain people are inherently, i.e. like genetically, more instinctive rulers, while other people are more natural fits to be workers or slaves. Um, nowadays, based on research by biological anthropologists, we recognize that uh, these early systems of classification, hierarchy, are um, quite unhelpful and dangerous ideas to have as well. Um, in the 1500s and 1600s, we of course see this thing that is called the scientific revolution. 
um, in European societies. And scientists then weren't, um, you know, scientists in Europe were not the first or the only scholars around the world to use observation and experimentation to understand, uh, understand the world around them. But hey, you know, living at the time, uh, at the end of the medieval period in Europe, these people found out increasingly that experiments, quantification, rational thought, these might be quite useful approaches in their work. Um, and that's the main difference between the work of the ancient Egyptians and Greeks and that of people like Galileo, Da Vinci, Newton, and Linnaeus. And as you may already know, Linnaeus is the one who classified all plants and animals he could observe under the um, naming system that he formalized called binomial nomenclature. And anthropologically, he was quite clever because he actually recognized that um, humans and apes and monkeys should be grouped together because he saw the anatomical um, similarities. But his worldview was still quite like essentialist, meaning that to him, organisms of a specific kind must have a certain you know, suite of traits. And uh, he also racially subdivided the human groups, uh, the human species into four groups. Um, and they were overtly racially derived, basically. Um, according to him, Africans were black skinned, ruled by erratic behavior. Um, Native Americans are red in skin tone and ruled by habit, whatever that means. Um, Asians, like me, are yellow or brown skinned and they are ruled by belief, whatever that means. And Europeans are white and regulated by custom. So these standards for categorization imply that Europeans are governed by uh, carefully considered culture and custom, but um, Asians, Americans, Africans, we are not in his framework um, very thoughtful <laughs> and not fit for leadership. And so Linnaeus, um, you know, we can thank him maybe for his uh, classification system, but, you know, for me, like looking at human variation, I don't think he got the right idea. Um, occurring alongside this scientific revolution, of course, was the age of discovery um, and the European colonial period between the 1400s and 1700s was, um, of course, marked by many violent um, and exploitative encounters overseas. And when Europeans arrived on the shores of continents that they were, uh, that were already inhabited, it was their first time meeting indigenous people in America um, and the new parts of Africa and new parts of Aust Australasia um, who looked differently from the way that they did. And so these biological ideas of these early scientists were, you know, symbiotic with the colonial period and the colonial project as well and establishing otherness and inferiority in other people was quite necessary at the time for uh, colonialists to sort of enforce their domination and the subordination of non-european people um, in my field specifically you could say that the beginning of uh, looking at human variation uh, starts with this guy another scientist at the time called uh, johann friedrich blumenbach um, who lived around 1700s, 1800s. And spoiler alert, like we don't like this guy at all. <laughs> Blumenbach, he classified humans into five races based on skull shape. And um, the term Caucasian was actually coined by him, for example. And so in this five skull chart, that middle skull there is the ideal skull shape. Um, and uh, he thought that the perfect climate conditions for humans to evolve in would have been in the Caucasus region uh, near the Caspian Sea, and so that's where the name Caucasian comes from. And very wrongly, he believed that the um, other subhuman species, uh, the, the other subspecies of human, could be categorized as Mongoloid, uh, Malayan. You know, these are all nonsensical terms that no, you know, no respectable scientist these days would use. And um, because to him, these four other categories were degenerated or transformed from that ideal Caucasian skull in the center. And biological anthropology was imbued with all of this sort of pseudoscience and um, ugliness, even up until the 1800s and 1900s. So um, in the early 20th century, we see a little bit of improvement in these ideas. And um, a number of new figures come into the science of human variation. And Franz Boas is a notable one. He was a German American anthropologist who um, he founded the American Anthropological Association, for example, in 1902. Um, and he argued that the scientific method 
uh, should be used in the study of human cultures. And the comparative method for looking at human biology worldwide was, come, uh, was invented by him. Um, he wrote in one essay for science in 1931, um, while individuals differ, biological differences between races are small. There is no reason to believe that one race is by nature so much more intelligent, uh, endowed with great willpower, or emotionally more stable than another, that the difference would materially influence its culture. And so this conclusion directly contrasts with the theories of the past that relied on essentialism. And biological anthropologists today have found a lot of evidence genetically that corroborates Boaz's earliest ideas. Um, the first half of the 1900s, it still involved some research that was um, focused on proving racial differences in things like morality, IQ, um, criminality, civilization. Uh, you know, we have people like Francis Galton to thank for that. And, um, you know, they were really trying to push the field of eugenics, which was a formal social science. Uh, of fitness and superiority among people of 19th century Europe. Um, and of course, in the 1930s, uh, Nazi Germany used these false ideas to, um, you know, come up with the idea that there are such things as pure races and they had really, really destructive effects, as many people know. Um, it's a good thing that we don't have them around anymore, right? And um, <laughs> um, after 1950, um, you know, some biological anthropologists, such as these guys, they wanted to create a different way of talking about human variation. So uh, races were redefined into simply populations that differ in the frequency of uh, a gene or some genes in combination. Um, so a population can be a group of any individuals potentially capable or actually interbreeding with others because they are close to each other geographically, um, or they share language, ethnicity, culture, history, and the same values. Uh, and in this way, we actually started to look at traits on their own and where traits are distributed around the world, instead of focusing on trying to prove that there are differences between people. Um, human diversity uh, cannot be broken down into discrete races. I, I, hope, I think that everybody knows that now. Um, together with uh, Dobzhansky, another scientist called Livingstone, he wrote in 1962, um, in this paper, I would like to point out that there are excellent arguments for abandoning the concept of race. Um, the last sentence in this uh, that I've shown you here, the position is here. There are no races, there are only clines. And so a cline is a, uh, is a gradation in the frequency of um, you know, uh, an allele or a trait between populations living in different geographic regions. And there's, of course, one very easily visible example of this, uh, looking at the clinal distribution of, um, of skin color around the world. And so whether you're in Southern Asia or in Sub-Saharan Africa or Australia, dark brown skin is found. Um, paler skin tones will be found in higher latitudes uh, around Europe and Siberia, Alaska. And so, you know, skin color is something that scientists have recently been able to really show again and again with many scientific studies, one after another, that, um, you know, there is such a thing as natural selection that produces these things and, um, you know, darker skin color protects uh, equatorial populations from high amounts of UV radiation. Um, and then there's a transition of lessening uh, pigmentation in individuals the further and further away you get from the tropics. Makes sense. Um, aside from natural selection, of course, uh, there are two other neutral ways that, um, or non-selective ways that can produce a cline in a human trait. And we now know, for example, that, um, that you know, the human uh, ABO blood group system is a very good example of neutral evolution. So for instance, um, scientists have identified uh, sort of like an east to west cline in the distribution of blood type B. Um, across Eurasia. And so uh, it's simply just because if people are closer to each other, the more likely it is they're going to have the same blood type. It isn't anything to do with, um, uh, you know, different groups being different because they are, uh, you know, genetically inferior or uh, too different. We're all the same species and sometimes our genes uh, and our gene pools mix in different ways thanks to our population history. Um, 
So, you know, uh, in the beginning of this talk, I mentioned that there were different types of biological anthropologists. And so in each of these subdisciplines, we have advanced technology so much, looking at things in new ways and making new discoveries almost every week um, about human evolution. Um, and geneticists have played a big role in that. Um, one last thing in genetics that I would like to show you guys is, um, you know, one problem with race-based classifications is that they rely on this uh, idea that people within a, type of, uh, within a typographical category will be more similar to each other than they are to people in other groups. But in 2002, um, there's a guy called Noah Rosenberg and his colleagues who explored this question. And so they looked at hundreds of markers in the human genome and they compared them across uh, lots of individuals, over a thousand individuals uh, that come from 52 different populations around the world. And what they showed, um, without a doubt, is that um, a majority of that genetic variance can be accounted for by within population differences in these 377 genetic loci, um, as opposed to uh, you know, coming from differences among the populations. Um, even if you were to divide these um, groups by you know, a number of regions, so let's say like you know, Africa, Oceania, East Asia, Europe, um, we still see the same pattern. 93 to 95% of that variation comes simply from the variation that exists within those populations on their own, not the difference between this population and another population. So um, distinct biological races does not exist. When we look at uh, primatology, this has been really interesting as well. Uh, when we look at, for example, chimpanzee genetic diversity, it is very fascinating that Western, Central, um, and Eastern, and Cameroonian chimpanzee groups actually have substantially more genetic diversity between them than us, than our human DNA. And this is surprising because all of these chimpanzee groups live so close to each other. Um, the reason that we think that uh, this is the case is because um, it, it could be just different um, migratory histories. So in each of these groups, uh, chimp these, these chimpanzees live in different habitats. And so they're um, only adapted for that specific climate and environment. They don't move around uh, and mix with each other that much over the last 6 million years. We instead, over the last 150,000 years have moved across the planet. And every time that you leave a place, like you leave Africa, for example, across that um, Egypt, you know, sort of Sinai Peninsula, you actually reduce uh, a very, you know, reduced sort of uh, genetic gene pool is, is moving there. And it's a, a bottlenecking effect or founder effect um, that reduces the amount of genetic variation uh, in the people all across the world. So, um, that's been interesting. Many people in my field also contribute um, in uh, looking at human biology by looking at cultural studies and ecological studies. So because a lot of the traits that we have today come from our interactions um, with the environment and depend on what we do day to day. So for example, there's a professor of biological anthropology at Loughborough University called Barry Bogan. Um, he's a specialist in human biology um, and he recently studied children in a Maya community from Guatemala who were known for a very short stature. They didn't grow very tall, but um, they, they, you know, a lot of these uh, families moved to Florida and California for a bunch of um, political reasons, maybe, or social reasons. Um, and then the children who would grow up in Florida and California, they were growing to uh, an average of 11 centimeters taller just in one generation of, of that move. And so Professor Bogan said that the, this phenomenon um, is found among groups of people who um, perhaps escape uh, poor living conditions and because the access to food and um, you know, less stressful conditions uh, is, is not inhibiting growth as much, uh, this trait that, uh, you know, this trait of human height that we traditionally see as a genetic trait is actually in part epigenetically determined, meaning that it happens after a person is born and it depends on whether, um, whether your, you know, your healthcare and your food uh, provision is good enough to allow you to reach that growth potential that you can grow up to. 
And so that's been really interesting to see in recent years. Um, a lot of people are looking at uh, interesting uh, topics to do with, um, you know, whether we, because we are subject to less evolutionary pressure, because we have, you know, technology and we're a lot less um, nomadic, we actually are quite sedentary and we stay in the same place, um, sitting on our butts in front of a computer screen all the time. Will that mean that our skeletons would become less robust? Um, do we have better or worse health given that um, our hygiene levels and antibiotics are improving so much? Does that mean our natural immune systems are more susceptible to disease? Um, with anthropogenic climate change, is the human body and our technology going to be able to keep up and adapt to increasingly unstable and uh, warm weather conditions? A lot of my research concentrates on the analysis of human remains from um, archaeology, and I try to reconstruct what daily life involved a long time ago. Um, so, for instance, uh, just take the study of, um, that I did in my PhD that was looking at really old um, remains from coastal Europe, so in Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania in the northeastern corner of Europe. And... Um, you know, it's a very coastal environment. People were relying on a lot of uh, fish and uh, they were hunting animals uh, in the forest. And then slowly, very, very slowly, they started to farm instead in later years. And I studied something, for example, like study, um, studying bone shape. And by looking at the uh, femur, which is the big bone in your thigh, I specifically looked at bone robusticity. And I could see that there was uh, different thicknesses of your thigh bone in different time periods, roughly 10,000, 6,000, 4,000, and 2,000 years ago. And so based on this, we actually have a better understanding of the ways that our body adapts to activity. Um, and only athletes these days uh, have remotely close to that level of bone strength. Um, but even then, they don't have anything, um, they, they don't measure up to like Bronze Age people who are working their legs really, really hard as they were farming um, back in the Bronze Age. So we can actually use, uh, scientists actually use these results to inform their studies on bone biology in sports science, for example, um, or in the medical field where we want to um, evaluate why is it that people get osteoporosis. Um, we can understand the processes of bone growth in people who have maybe lost their limbs um, or have gone up to space as astronauts. So they're working their legs in different ways because of the absence of gravity. So um, the cross-disciplinary sort of uh, links are, are really quite interesting there. And finally, we also look at human evolutionary questions. So in our big family tree of uh, hominins and human-like forms, um, how do we know when exactly we developed bigger brains? Who was it that used fire for the first time? Why do we walk on two legs? Um, for how long have Homo sapiens been the only species to, to outlast all the rest? And so these are questions that don't, we don't have answers to fully, um, but we uncover evidence every year and we have some theories about those questions. Uh, lately, uh, recent excavations, yeah, recent excavations um, have uncovered a lot of weird fossils and uh, traces of evidence. On the left here, you see examples of um, uh, fossils from the Indonesian island of Flores. Uh, where all these uh, very small bodied people were living. They grew up to like about a meter tall only. Uh, they, they were actually still living there when Homo sapiens arrived 50,000 years ago. What was their interaction like? We don't know. Um, in South Africa, we have uh, hundreds of fossils uh, which date to around 250,000 years ago. And that's the same time that Homo sapiens starts to emerge in um, East Africa and South Africa as well. Uh, we don't know what their relationship was to us, uh, these homo naledi. Um, also, the discovery of a few teeth and finger bone from Denisova Cave in Siberia. Uh, it might not seem like a lot, but we've been able to get a lot of genetic evidence just from those teeth. And these genomes actually show that we each have, well, only certain human populations today have some of that DNA in them. Um, specifically Aboriginal Australians and Southeast Asians. So how is it that um, these bones in Siberia have genes um, that, you know, also today's Aboriginal Australians and Southeast Asians also have? Um, we don't know the range of the Denisovans. 
and what their relationship was like with Neanderthals and us, um, but only future studies will tell. Um, so to conclude sort of uh, and reach the end of my talk, um, it has also been very important lately for a lot of our people in our field to amp up their outreach and amp up also um, their work that tries to diversify who does biological anthropology. So I come from Hong Kong and I'm one of only a handful of people from Hong Kong to do what I do. I think a lot of the uh, geological and biological sciences, we are predominantly managed and supervised by older, uh, cishet, white, able-bodied male mentors. And many of us want to shake things up. Um, how is it that we are going to be able to tell the most accurate and sort of historically sensitive narratives about humanity and don't commit the same mistakes that the earliest scientists uh, committed uh, if we don't have all of humanity sort of ish represented uh, or better represented in who does the science itself. Um, and as I hinted at throughout, our field is also linked to a lot of other applied sciences. So it becomes very important in research design to diversify who comes up with those research approaches. Uh, the more inclusive and equitable our field, the more we're able to design scientific research that has social value and social good of wider communities in mind. Um, as part of like my work with bigger organizations in my field, like um, in America and the UK, we each have um, like a, an association for our discipline. There are a number of programs and initiatives that we're doing to welcome more people um, in who does the science. Um, and also in, as part of that, we also are thinking a lot about how we talk about human variation and evolution so that a lot of uh, alt-right racist groups out there and pseudoscientists out there don't look at genetic studies or look at biological studies and manipulate our findings in the press or online um, and you know, continue to perpetuate quite old fashioned ideas about human variation. Um, as part of that, actually, I have a podcast. Uh, this is the last thing I'm going to say. Uh, I have a podcast called the Arcananth Podcast. If anybody wants to uh, hear interviews about human evolution and history and development, um, I interview people. I interview someone different on every episode. And so it really is a very wide variety of people that um, I interview. They study teeth. They study blood, bone. They study um, human pottery and human uh, culture, cave art, forensics, um, indigenous archaeology. There's a lot to, uh, to, to consume. Um, at the moment, I actually have 110 episodes out. Uh, I, I, I release the podcast episodes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So um, check it out. Thank you so much to all of you for listening. And thank you so much to Matt for organizing. <laughs>